online at 560theanswer.com on the AM560 mobile app, on your Alexa-powered smart speaker, and on TuneIn, iHeart, and on Odyssey. This is Chicago's Morning Answer with Dan Proft and Amy Jacobson on AM560, The Answer. Cause they got the beat, the campus beat, the campus beat. Yeah, the campus beat. Yeah, uh, Herbie Husker apparently uh, is the mascot for the Nebraska Cornhawkers. Apparently is uh, flirting with white supremacy. And Why? so he had to be, uh, uh, well, he had to be uh, touched up a bit. Uh, it turns out that um, he was uh, using the OK hand gesture. And Hello. as we know uh, from five minutes ago, uh, that is apparently a hand gesture used by some white supremacists somewhere. Well, I don't and know so, what scuba divers, scuba divers are going to do because you use that sign all the time while you're diving. Uh huh. The OK yeah. sign because that's that's the you know that's universal. It's been they they had that since the beginning of time. Nebraska Athletics Licensing Director Lana Heinrichs, uh, the hand gesture could in some circles represent something it does not represent. What Nebraska athletics is about, we just didn't want to be associated with portraying anything that somebody might think you know that it means white power. According to the Anti-Defamation League, this OK symbol is used by a small group of white supremacists who started using it in 2017 to troll others. OK, so now Herbie Husker, Herbie Husker, I should say, is going to use we're number one hand gesture instead of the OK hand gesture. So what happens if a white supremacist somewhere is identified as using the we're number one gesture? Do you have to go back and... Or cut uh, off Herbie, his fingers. Her, Herbie Husker to come up with something new. Yeah. Uh, do we? Ha I mean, this is, of course, yeah. over the last couple of years, we've seen this in other venues, too. A Jeopardy champion had to, like, apologize that her OK on Jeopardy wasn't really a white. I mean, like, the default position is anybody who makes that hand gesture as a white supremacist, of course, is the poison here, in addition to the silliness of chasing and giving profile to people that are trolling you for the purposes of behaving so that you behave like adult, like these people are behaving. And this is what uh, is concerning the deep thinkers on college campuses these days. Uh, and if you're uh, traumatized by a Herbie Husker hand gesture or something akin to that, Colorado State University, this uh, big, uh, sign they put up on campus if you or someone you know are affected by a free speech event on campus here are some resources and they list the what uh, the the departments and their phone numbers that you can call there are 17 17 different departments on the campus of colorado state the ramps that you can access if you or someone you know is affected by a free speech event on campus. Victim assistance hotline. Oh no. Incidents of bias reporting, multicultural okay. counseling, employee assistance program, the Office of Equal Opportunity, oh, the God. Asian Pacific American Cultural Center, the Black African American Cultural Center, the uh, Native American Cultural Center, the Pride Resource Center, the Student Disability Center, the Women and Gender Advocacy Center, El Centro, which I assume is the Latino, Latino uh, yeah. uh, American Resource Center. Maybe uh, this is why uh, folks like um, uh, University of Pennsylvania law professor Amy Wax said uh, a couple years ago, she said, told it to us on our show, yeah, um, the Ivy League is not salvageable. You essentially need to crater it and start over. Or alternatively, I suppose, you need to start uh, founding new institutions that uh, provide uh, a high quality education that don't obsess about the hand gestures of their mascots and are interested in uh, preparing young people how to be successful in life and intellectually curious throughout said life. Well, that's sort of the position, not sort of, that is the position that our next guest has taken. His name is Albert Eisenberg. He's a political consultant, 
consultant and founder of the nonprofit media outlet Broad Plus Liberty. Albert, thanks for joining us. Appreciate it. Hey, Dan. Hey, Amy. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, so um, we referenced your piece last week in a discussion about higher ed and, and the a piece you wrote on Glenn Lowry's Substack about this Alt Academy, and uh, Glenn Lowry's involved in the, the University of Austin as well, so that dovetailed nicely for him, Glenn Lowry, econ professor at Brown. Um, so, you know, sort of give us your perspective on this idea of rolling out new institutions of higher ed to... Uh, revitalize higher ed in America? Sure. Well, you know, the amount of outrages and annoyances that are caused by the elite academies sort of veering into outer space could fill probably um, a universe's worth of uh, morning talk radio at Fox and any other amount of fodder just with the, you know, excesses spilling out into the workplace, into politics, and it's a lot of why our country has gone insane and the temptation for conservatives, for free thinking people, for people who have been um, turned away is to turn away and bury our heads in the sand or just or just make fun of it. But in fact, it, it really is poisoning American civic life. The um, sharp left turn of our university culture and the censoriousness and the lack of real research it's crippling us when we talk about our competition with China. For example, they are not hyper-focused on decolonizing STEM. They are focused on, you know, learning and developing AI. So the idea is basically rather than, you know, making fun of it and being irritated by it, why not spend a portion of our energy founding and funding a new institution that resists this type of groupthink and um, <clears throat> far-left, you know, dogma in the form of what I call an alt academy, an alternate academy that will actually be dedicated to the pursuit of open discourse, real research, um, will develop academics who have been shunned by, you know, or opted out of the far left wing academic institutions that we find ourselves in today. Um, we'll bring in students, not just conservative students, but free thinking students, students who are tired of this campus group think, and as a key factor, we'll bring in funders who are tired of funding institutions that basically hate capitalism and hate them and hate the lives they've chosen to pursue. So you bring those three groups together, disaffected students, um, academics who are just completely under, you know, under the wire in every, every sense, and then funders who are tired of funding institutions that hate them. And you could easily build something new. So it's sort of a call to action that I hope will spur people to uh, invest in an idea like that. Would Why we call it University of Free Thinking? Well, or you call it Hillsdale College. I mean, right, why, why not just, uh, you know, build on the few colleges in the country that are left and have them, I don't know, start setting up extension campuses then rather than reinventing the wheel? at least initially. I think you could build, you could certainly build on some of the, the institutions that are left. But if you're talking about, you know, there's been so much movement, let's say online with what you'd call the ideal um, intellectual dark web, this sort of nonpartisan, non-religious um, online discourse. And it's kind of ironic or, or not that I, I published on Substack, which is an alternate media source since the media is completely, you know, kneecapped itself similar to the way our Ivy League institutions have. Um, but the idea is basically like a Hillsdale College is really um, a great, important institution, but I think it seems like a sort of right wing Christian institution, at least from my perspective as a Jewish person, I would not have gone to Hillsdale College. I could go to a sort of new, innovative university dedicated to free and open discourse. So I think it needs new branding. I think it mm -hmm. needs to be something different. Right. I mean, there are other such examples, but your point is well taken. I mean, let a thousand flowers bloom for sure. And so sure. Um, and, and, and so uh, the landscape, too, I mean, that this is a landscape that also includes at this point, like Peter Thiel and his foundation, where he gives like promising, I think, Ivy League, but maybe it's just promising young students in, in undergrad um, the opportunity to apply for hundred thousand dollar grants to get out of college and go pursue some entrepreneurial idea they have. 
Um, I mean, I get maybe the two are complementary that until the college options improve, uh, plays like Peter Thiel is making with his grants make a lot of sense. I don't know. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think, you know, the conservative populist nationalist movement is very much a working person's movement. So that does make sense. But at the same time, we cannot turn away from the fact that the elites of our country, just like the elites of any country since the university concept was invented, you know, a thousand years ago, have been university educated. So that doesn't mean that there's not a place for that. But we also cannot we need a university or several universities or a university ecosystem that will foster, you know, intellectual and academic thought that is not far left wing. Now, you discussed this problem with Glenn Lowry, and what was his advice or what were his, his thoughts? Well, I think he, he, <laughs> he was interested in it, and when I pitched him on the idea, he said, actually, we're doing something like that with the University of Austin, so right. people can go to uaustin.org. Very interesting new concept, bringing together, again, free thinkers, not the type of people um, that you would associate necessarily with a uh, sort of a right-way Christian institution, um, So I think that he said basically to me, which is in the piece, that if you can make this idea happen, it's a billion dollar idea, just because there is so much um, disaffection among academics and among students. And I think that's a key, key thing there. There are conservative students on the ground in universities everywhere. I know them. But the pipeline for academics has basically been completely shut off because if you're going into a Ph.D. program and postgraduate, you're either going to have to completely hide or censor your thoughts or really hope to to squeak by. But the odds of squeaking by are very low. So this would also foster sort of a research arm and, and, you know, like who is going to be researching whether three to five year olds who have been masked because of covid are have poor outcomes socially in the next upcoming years. I don't think Brown University is going to allow no. that research. I think a lot of universities aren't. So we need, desperately need, free-thinking institutions to fund that kind of research. Right, and and you need places to land for people like Glenn Lowry or the next generation of Glenn Lowry's right. talent, talented exactly. academics in their fields, but and they're you know one or two in a department because the gatekeepers at these universities have effectively effectively established a political litmus test so they keep conservatives out and keep control of the institutions ideologically and so uh one or two here in this department one or two here in that department but that does not a uh an open marketplace of ideas make and so you know create places where you could have a couple of hundred academics that are free thinkers across the spectrum with all kinds of different ideas and then you know let's see exactly what the market bears in terms of how many more institutions like that you could build with how many more different thinkers when you uh uh when when you relieve that bottleneck that i'm describing correct it, it, yeah the token conservative you know law or econ professor is not enough to create you know a university structure that is um going to actually create you know the 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 factor of having multiple people together the like ecosystem so that's kind of a call to action here well and the other thing too would be interesting to see as these um these innovations these competitors develop is what exactly the student demand is because the problem you have is uh, in the pipeline is not just with academics but it's with students because they're coming out of k through 12 government school systems and a lot of private schools prepared to continue to be indoctrinated at leftist universities the way they were at the K through 12 level. So what's their attraction to, you know, how many people, I should say, are going to be attracted to University of Austin or some other uh, competitor? Right. Well, if you think of it, even if only 1% of college students are self-selecting and interested in this, it would fill, you know, dozens of universities. There, there are a lot, a lot of students who are not happy with the current groupthink culture. And you're right, it's a systemic issue, but we have to start solving it. We have to start solving it rather than just, you know, being irritable about it. And I see so many people on the right, you know, so frustrated and outraged all the time. And I agree, I'm frustrated and outraged with the status quo, <laughs> how things are going. But we have to do more than just um, complain. We have to build something new. And, and, you know, and, and this is obviously a labor and capital intensive project when you're not talking just about an online resource, but you're actually talking about a, 
a campus environment, which is attractive to a lot of young people and their parents because of the generational inertia and because of the experience of being with other people, as we've seen over the last two years. And so, so I, you know, how, how fast can these things at University of Austin or competitors come online, do you think, even if they had the initial seed capital to get off the ground? I think in um, in a matter of a couple years, depending on where you put it. I mean, if I were planning something like this, and I'm not planning, I'm just throwing an idea into the ether and hoping somebody, you know, <laughs> richer than me decides to do it. Um, if I were doing it, I mean, you definitely want to put it in a red state. You definitely want to put it somewhere where there are, you know, zoning issues where you can buy a lot of land and, and get zoned the right way and, you know, be able to clear the um, deck so you can actually build something. But I, I have to imagine if something is done well um, and efficiently, it can be done in a couple of years time. And, and there is tons of precedent for people buying a lot of land, either in existing universities to sure. acquire new camp, you know, new campuses or new um, annexes and building quickly within a year or two. So I, I could see this coming online and it's certainly desperately needed. Sure. Look what Tom Donahue did with Ave Maria in Florida, the former uh, Domino CEO. So you're right. There mm-hmm. are precedents for it. Uh, he is Albert Eisenberg, political consultant and founder of the nonprofit media outlet Broad Plus Liberty. His piece to save higher education, free thinkers must launch an alt academy. Albert, thanks for joining us. Appreciate it. Thank you both. All right, thank you. And he joined us on our turnkey.pro answer line. If you're talking about it, Dan and Amy are talking about it. It's Chicago's Morning Answer on AM 560, The Answer. Signature Bank is Chicago's fastest growing independently owned business bank. It's a bank where relationships still matter. Signature Bank knows your name and your story. I'm Dan Proft, and I know this because Signature Bank is. 